Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, uh, I, I get the good fortune today of introducing um, Yuval Shmulovitz, um, who's going to be giving our webinar today. Uh, he is, uh, has a master's degree um, from the Hebrew University of, Jeru of Jerusalem, and he's now finishing up his PhD there. And um, I've had the good fortune of working with Yuval over the last year. Um, I've learned so much from him around Arab Land Escarpment Retreat. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to his talk today where he's gonna be talking about some of that work um, that he's been, been, he's been doing. So I'll hand it off to you, Yuval. Thanks, Matt. I will show the screen. Okay, so uh, hello, everyone. It's uh, very nice to be here. And uh, so, yeah, my name is Yuval, and I am a PhD student from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel. And today I will discuss a um, work that I've been doing with um, uh, colleagues from uh, CU Boulder, from Utah State University, and from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, so the title of the talk is uh, Modeling Long-Term Arid Cliffs and Sub-Cliff Slope Evolution under the show duration extreme rainstorm events. So in this project, we uh, focus on uh, arid cliffs and the uh, slope uh, four main processes. And we also working on uh, integrating uh, rainfall forcing at the scale of uh, individual rainstorm into landscape evolution modeling. Um, so I, I will begin and as uh, in the picture that you, the satellite picture that you have on your screen, you can see uh, Sinai uh, Peninsula. Uh, maybe I'll just, uh, yeah, there is a pointer. Okay. So you can see Sinai uh, Peninsula with uh, the red or uh, black colors of uh, crystalline rocks uh, from the Precambrian uh, crystalline rocks from the Arabian Nubian shield. On top of these rocks, you can see a yellowish, mainly carbonates uh, rock, that uh, these hard carbonate rocks form uh, roughly 100 kilometers of escarpment with, with cliffs. Also in this uh, picture, you can see an individual cloud in a blue sky. This uh, 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 well to intermediate developed cloud and similar cloud like this one, in maybe in more advanced stage are responsible for a significant and large rainstorm event um, in deserts. This, such an event also induce a significant hydrogeomorphic responses. And uh, this project is uh, aimed to couple this uh, discrete uh, uh, rainstorm forcing with the long-term evolution of cliffs in deserts. So cliffs are, a very common landform in dry areas. Uh, these features are often developed uh, in area where uh, there are sequences of uh, sedimentary or volcanic rocks. Um, usually the more resistant uh, layers create these cap rocks, steep cap rocks, that uh, laid of, over a much softer, uh, lower and erodible uh, layers. Um, through time, the cliff is routed from its local base level and uh, subcliff slope or talus slope or active slopes are developed uh, beneath this cliff. Um, these uh, slopes are also covered by sediment that delivered from the uh, cliff. And this sediment on the top of the subcliff slopes are experienced uh, weathering. And uh, through time, they are getting uh, into smaller and smaller fine pieces. Uh, the longitude profile of this slope is usually is uh, trending from being uh, concave to so slightly convex uh, normally. So such features, cliffs features are uh, um, actually uh, common in many of the uh, arid lands all over the world. This map shows some example for large cliff systems. Uh, we talk already about the Sinai, Escarpment, or and, and I will talk more uh, with in the in the presentation on, on negative sites. Both of them are experiencing today a hot climate, 
uh, but we have clicks also, for example, in the Colorado Plateau that experience in a, a generally a cold uh, desert climate, arid climate. Um, obviously, this uh, climatic context of uh, cliffs um, all over the world affect the, the processes and the forms uh, of these uh, cliffs uh, and subcliff slopes. Um, some uh, specific uh, examples from uh, the map that I just uh, showed. Here is uh, the Mesa Verde in Colorado, and you can see here um, a clear contact between the cap rock and the lower layer slope. Um, in other cases, other examples, such as the Ethiopian Highlands or the South of Morocco example, the contact is much less clear, and there is uh, some height of talus accumulation or subcliff slope accumulation that still receive material from the cliff. Also uh, not noticeable in the picture is the uh, weathering pattern of the cliff that is varied between different sites. For example, in, in this site in Spain, you can see these large boulders that weathered from the cliff. In, and while in other places, um, the material supply from the cliff are much uh, finer uh, in a scale of uh, centimeters. Called. So research on desert cliff is, of course, motivated by their dominant in our areas. Um, in addition to that, um, surface processes along cliffs, such as rockfall, debris flow, flash flood, our uh, uh, impact infrastructure and also civilization nowadays. And um, in addition to these two uh, reasons, um, Researchers were historically attracted to cliffs um, for studying uh, climatic or uh, base level changes because they are a relative systematic uh, geomorphic system and they are also sensitive to the local conditions. So over the years, uh, there are um, uh, many studies regarding cliff and uh, subcliff slopes, and some of them have been uh, achieved uh, to correlate between subcliff uh, slopes evolution or detached slopes evolution with climatic forcing at different scales um, or climatic oscillation at different scales, such as glacial or interglacial cycles. One of the general uh, uh, conceptual model uh, claimed that during wet phase, the subcliff slope form a relatively uh, uh, continuous slope, undissected slope, while alternation into drier conditions, and detach this uh, continuous slope from the cliff to what we call, sometimes called like, talus flat iron. And then the cliff um, is turned into more sediment starved mode. However, still this topic is on, really on debate. The correlation to general, general climatic condition is not uh, well established everywhere. And the understanding of the coupling between sediment supply, weathering, uh, sediment transport on the slope, and climate is uh, still poorly, poorly understandable. Nowadays, many of the cliffs around the world are uh, actually located on inside the climatic gradient. Here is an example from uh, the Blue Cliffs in uh, Utah. You can see this uh, roughly 100 kilometer escarpment. You, it is, uh, you can see the um, really wet and vegetated, relatively wet and vegetated part in the northwestern uh, part, relative to the southwestern part. And also by looking on the picture from the field, you can see there are differences in the morphology. You can see by eye um, regarding the, the, the cliff thickness, the, the slope and so on. On final, on final scale, this is the central negative. Uh, we are looking on a 40 kilometer escarpment um, that is also lying today within a climatic gradient. The northeastern part of this uh, crater or, or this escarpment is um, uh, receiving in a year about 40 to 50 millimeters, while the southwestern edge of the, this escarpment receives around 100 millimeters. I guess that for some of you that work in much more humid places, 
this difference of 40 or 50 millimeter in a year uh, don't sound a lot, but in deserts, it can alternate the vegetation pattern. It can induce uh, differences in the hydrological and geomorphic responses. This is our two pictures from two edges of the Ramon escarpment. And uh, I should uh, say that along this escarpment, we don't see variation, significant variation in the lithology. But as you can see, there are differences in the morphology. So this site is the drier site. You can see the uh, thickness of the cliff is about 50 meters and the debris cover is really relatively limited. While in the more wetter side, uh, the cliff uh, is more covered by debris and the thickness of the, the uh, debris seems to be much higher. Um, so the point of, of these two pictures is that uh, we, although there are relatively minor changes in the annual rainfall, as I said, about 40, 50 millimeter in a year, we do notice changes, significant changes that are related uh, probably to climate. And, and even though the, everything is inside the arid and even the hyper arid rain. Going deeper, even to the microclimate scale, this is a site from the Eastern Hegel. It's called Tsuk Tamru. Here the cap rock is the chert and the softer white rock or chalk. And in this site, uh, we see that our differences uh, in aspects of the cliff retreat and the cliff morphology that uh, uh, we claim the uh, effect of the microclimate conditions. So generally we see an increase in the uh, cliff retreat toward the south facing aspect. And we also observe changes in the morphology of the cliff, of the subcliff slope, and even in the long-term transport rate of sediments that we obtain by cosmogenic nuclei. We, as I said, we, um, we um, consider this change to be affected mainly by the microclimate conditions um, along the south relative to the north facing aspect. So um, arid landscape and arid catchment in general are influenced, uh, influenced by rainfall characteristics. Um, rainfall in arid area is quite unique and is firstly characterized by high uh, spatial and also temporal variability. An example for that you can see the map on the left side. Uh, this is a, a map from the Wollongad experimental watershed. And this is a high zoyat from rain gauges. And you can see that along the 100 meters, we, there, are, there is a decrease in rainfall about 14%. And another example for that is from the uh, uh, Renat 2021 paper. This is a radar map for three days rainfall, a single event. And you can notice on the very spotty uh, rainfall cores and the large gradient space, there are places with 150 millimeter during the storm, while in few kilometers away from there, um, the rainfall is almost zero. This uh, spatial variability in rainfall is in part a result of the convective nature of the rainfall in this area. So uh, this is an example for convective sail from uh, the Eastern Negev as well. You can see first how local is it, it is. This is a scale of three kilometers. And first you can see how fast rainfall are decreasing, the rainfall intensity are decreasing from the center uh, outside. Um, this uh, convective nature of rainfall also responsible for very high uh, rainfall intensities and especially for the short duration. So uh, the diagram on the left is connected to when rainfall intensity, uh, the retain period for the, for the rainfall intensity and different durations. Uh, you can see that the red curve, which is for the arid area, are diverged from the uh, two other curves for the two other uh, climate zones which means that arid area are characterized for the rare, rare retain, retain levels. It's characterized by very high rainfall intensity, especially for the uh, short durations. So these short duration intensities are important, and especially for the surface processes. 
many of uh, pioneer uh, works in, in the deserts, experimental studies, but also uh, more recent studies have pointed out that uh, rainfall intensity and the profile of uh, rainfall intensities within storms is influenced the infiltration rate, it's influenced influence the rainfall run of uh, concentration and generation, and also the exceeding of uh, uh, erosion thresholds. I want to give um, an example for that uh, by looking on this video and rather on the radar map. So this combined video will, will show on the left radar maps uh, for a very short event in the Eastern Negev. And the video on the right will show a field picture from a time-lapse camera that has been installed in the field during this storm. And uh, the, the picture are uh, correspond to each other the picture show exactly the same minutes as the radar data. So at first you can notice this is a, a look downwards of a slope, a talus slope in a Tsuktamu table mountain. And you can see that uh, before the rain comes, the, the talus slope is totally dry. Whenever the storm start uh, to arrive the area, you can see this very, high intensity is all over. And if you can see there are small rills and gullies that fill with water. After the storms ends, um, the water infiltrates and about uh, five to seven minutes after the, run, the, the rainfall arrived, the slope um, is dry again. So up to now, I, I was trying to uh, summarize all the challenges for coupling uh, surface processes or arid landscapes to specific climatic conditions in desert. And I mentioned the high spatial temporal variability of the rainfall, complex uh, hydrometeorological responses, uh, evaluation of extreme events. And also I should mention that our, the, record, the, the, the fact the records are uh, uh, limited in space and also in time. Uh, this is all together bring us to the reasoning that uh, uh, processes on dry land cliffs and slopes need storm scale examination and approximation are often not valid in such areas. However, this brings a great challenge because uh, storm scale forcing is obviously a scale of uh, minutes or even smaller than minutes, but uh, landscape evolution is, uh, of course, in a much larger time scale. This uh, brings a lot of challenges, including uh, computational power and, uh, and so on. So to tackle this um, challenge, we uh, I will present our own, I don't know agenda or the main approach. So first, we collect rainfall and topographic data in high resolution, and then we are uh, design storms for different retained periods, and and I will elaborate about this in in the next slide. And our uh, final or last stage is to develop a landscape evolution model that can be fed by the design storm. So what is the design storm? We call it the um, intensity duration frequency design storm. Um, we, I, will, uh, um, I will explain it by, by an example. So we can have a diagram that, as I, we saw before when we have the rainfall intensities, the return level and different return periods. Using these curves, we can build a, a, a conceptual storm, design one, a, or artificial one, that is corresponding to specific return period. It can be the five-year return period, 50-year, or 100-year return period. By that, we actually design storm that is corresponding to specific return level. And then if we simulate this storm, we can bridge, bridge the gap and, and evaluate the impact of extreme event. Uh, on the landscape if we are losing, uh, if we are using uh, the appropriate, uh, appropriate model. So our next mission was to develop uh, a model and we do it uh, using the LandLab uh, toolkit. I will, I will try to give a general background, background or introduction into the model components now. So the model is in general, uh, has two units, the Caprock units, and another erodible, much more erodible layer. We also include a, a soil layer, which, which is a much, much uh, uh, 
סין לא היה דעתי, מנהלי developed from cliff derived sediment and it's up to few meters of depth. The hydrological component in the model are and the infiltration, uh, infiltration by green and up concept and runoff generation is uh, we are using a diffusion wave approximation for overland flow. Uh, it's diffusion wave approximation is uh, actually the simplification of the shallow water equation that omits the momentum term and the flow velocity is calculated based on the linearization of the Manning equation. This both component are already available Land up to toolkit. The soil layer is represented here by uh, 30 uh, size classes of, uh, of uh, soil fragments or soil crusts. Uh, we include here um, an important uh, feature of our slope, which is class fragmentation. Uh, we've done it by the concept that we follow or adapt the concept of wells and the uh, and, uh, coin of the soil uh, fragmentation. It's mainly built on some transition matrix that uh, transfer a mass of, uh, of class from specific size fraction to another one. And um, I really hope that soon uh, uh, our version to this, uh, uh, to this model will be free and available in the repository soon. Uh, sediment transport uh, of the class is, uh, is done by, is calculated or determined by uh, the shear stress uh, exerted by the overland flow. Um, we choose to include here a selective transport scheme in which the transport of a given size fraction is not depends only on the size itself, but also on the size of the surrounding grains. The total flux from, from a specific node will be the sum of, uh, of fluxes for all the size fractions um, for all the size classes of fragments that are uh, included in the specific nodes on the slope. There are two additional components in the model. One, of, one is the incision. I, 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 sorry, I will say that this component, I hope that also will be very, will be soon, will be available in the repository. And there are two additional components. One is an incision of the soft rock. We've done it by the already existing component of the depth slope product erosion. And we also include a hill slope diffusion using the linear diffusion component in the repository as well. Okay, so um, the next um, process that uh, we invest much to, to represent is cliff retreat. And here we are uh, including two, two types of, of retreating. One is cliff uh, weathering, what we call kind of grain by grain weathering. This process will uh, act on all the cliff sections that are not covered by sediment. So all the uh, uh, cliff sections that are not uh, covered by sediment are exper experiencing weathering. They, and they are weathered in a parallel way. And then we determine the critical node following um, some concept of the highland component of uh, Benjamin uh, Kempfort's. So we um, define the critical node and then all the uh, sediment that has been eroded, eroded above this critical node are run out using the highland component uh, run out algorithm. And uh, so they are run out in a kind of landslide like um, way. So this, uh, the sediment ran, ran out after weathering the course and they are deposited uh, beneath the slope and, uh, and they form a talus slope. The second process of uh, retreating, retreating is cliff undermining. So we assume that whenever there is the a softer layer is exposed and the contact between the cap rock and the lower layer is exposed, we uh, all uh, the cliff section above is uh, collapse according to, to some determined fracture plane and the sediment are run out again using the highland component uh, down slope. This type of uh, retreating is uh, maybe some of you are familiar with this, maybe it's similar to the, the conceptual model of Coons that determined the cliff retreat would be 
Manila is a function of the evacuation of the talus, uh, talus debris and the exposure of the, of the softer layer. So I would like to summarize some of the uh, advantage of the approach or the model we developed here. So first, first we have explicit representation of hydrology. Second, we calculate the sediment flux from shear, shear stress, and we also include class selective transport scheme. We are using the landslide-like sediment runout of the Camp Forts 2020, and we also include two, two type of retreat mechanisms. Using this model, we, I will now um, share with you some, some of the results regarding two main research qu questions. One is what are the main uh, factors that drive diversity of arid cliff and subcliff slope morphology. And second, what are the conditions under which cliffs becomes buried or unburied? So the main simulation scheme is more like in, in the hydrological modeling way. We do it event-based. That means that we are simulate 100 hill storm uh, 1,000 times. This is, should be equivalent to 100 thousand uh, years in total. So the 100 year storm, we uh, define the base storm. Uh, this base storm is based, is based on statistical analysis of rainfall in the central Negev. You can see here uh, uh, a diatograph of the rainfall intensity. You just notice the, the scale is uh, flipped. And uh, based on this, these statistics, we, we, we use this storm as a base case. The cliffs to determine the factor that govern what uh, makes cliff to be buried or not. We uh, played with many parameters regarding the model. So it could be the cliff inclination, the sediment size from the cliff, the lower layer gradient, and so on. I will focus here today mainly, mainly on, uh, on the rainfall intensities and on the size of sediment that's uh, supplied from the cliff. To emphasize why it is important to include the intensities pattern and not just a constant intensity storm, I will use this example. So here we have the diagram as before with the diatograph of the, of the 100 year storm, and we have the water depth in blue regarding this storm. In dashed black line, it's a constant intensity storm and, and the corresponding water depth. We can translate the water depth into a critical grain size. That's mean the, the critical grain size for motion. So we can do it for all the hydrograph, and then we have in y axis we translated the hydrograph, the water depth to critical grain size. Now we can ask ourselves what will, will happen to a 30 millimeter cluster. So um, you can notice here that if we are talking about the constant intensity storm, the class will not mobilize because the, the critical grain size of the storm is uh, lower than the 30 millimeter cluster while uh, uh, time varying intensities, the peak is get higher and therefore this sediment is predicted to move. Integration of many of such moments may, may result in totally different uh, morphology. And this is, the, um, uh, this is why intensity fluctuation are important. Okay, so the first test was for, for the model was to check it against the uh, measurement. And we use the, uh, an analytical, uh, analytical um, solution for cliff uh, degradation, um, one of the Fisher Lemma and one of the of Baker and Laux. And both of these analytical solutions were tested in, uh, in, uh, at the field by uh, Hodgson 1998. Their model assumption was that weathering produced an equal retreat of all part of the exposed free phase, as we have seen here. The resulting debris accumulated at the cliff base, and the cliff bedrock that, that is covered by sediment is protected from the future, future weather. So uh, here is the result, uh, the numerical simulation relative to the analytical solutions. So you see the, the both analytical solutions of the uh, bedrock, this black curve, uh, official Lehman and uh, Baker Lehux, both of them. Uh, are here and the pluses uh, are the numerical solution of the model. Uh, as, assuming we force the model that will be no transport as, as the concept uh, or as the analytical model uh, require. 
So the acceptance between these two uh, uh, make us to trust the model and, and maybe prove that it presents a relatively realistic pattern of, of cliff retreat, and then we, we, we were motivated to move on. The next test was to examine the model um, against uh, a field data um, with, in different conditions. So you saw this picture already. This is from the Ramon escarpment. And what I didn't say to you before, that we also have measurement except of picture, we have measurements. And we know that from the northeastern side, the, uh, there are smaller grain sizes and there are higher extreme intensities that we uh, calculate from uh, rainfall statistical analysis. This is relatively to the southwestern side where we recognize that are much larger grain sizes from the cliff and lower extreme intensities. So our test was to uh, uh, simulate the model with disposed cases and to see if we can get similar uh, morphology of uh, cliff and subcliff slope as we observed today at the field. So just before I go into the simulation videos, I want to give you, uh, um, I want to invest uh, one moment to just uh, show description how to, to read this video. So we'll have quite funny diagrams like that when the red lines is the initial conditions and it's full time we will have additional lines. The blue lines will be the, top, the topography. The um, gray line will be the bedrock and uh, green line will be the electrological contact. So this is our videos from Ramon, uh, um, Ramon-like or central Negev-like simulations. At the left, we have the case when uh, we include lower intensities and larger cliff uh, derived class size. This is the, uh, uh, you see the legend D50 for each node within the model. And in the right, um, figure you see the eastern, northeastern site like case when there are a higher intensity and the cliff supply smaller class. And um, you can see that uh, the cliff from Ramon site is start to get buried whenever the uh, relatively to the quasi steady state of the northeastern site like. So this diagram are end of simulation. Uh, um, figures, the red line is the end of simulation for both cases. And this is uh, observations that as uh, uh, I showed you before. So we can compare the cliff height and you can see that the model, the pattern, uh, the model predict are quite similar. We have a thinner cliff in the west and larger cliff in the south, in the uh, northeast. And also the grain size pattern are similar. The blue lines here are grain size according to the second y-axis. And this uh, grain size uh, of each node can be compared to data and the trends and also the numbers are uh, quite similar. Um, yeah, so, okay, so we want to have more systematic examination of the, of the rule of grain size. And uh, here we conduct two experiments. All the parameters are identical, but the differences are in the um, sediment of uh, grain size supplied from the cliff. So the right figure, you, we are looking on cases where the cliff provide block in a scale of one meter to the, to the slope. And in the left case, the cliff uh, they provide much smaller uh, material. And you can see the, how the cliff is getting buried in the right case relative to the, to the left case. Um, we can also look um, on how the grain size change through the simulations. So this is space time diagram. Y is the time or number of storms. And this is distance from the lower uh, node uh, upwards. So if we, are, if we are standing on this node, let's say this is the 50 meter node from the outlet and we're going up, this means that we're going onwards in time. And you can see that we had kind of abrupt change in the sediment size. This is because of kind of landslide or, or rockfall that deliver directly to this node. And then we have slowly reducing in grain size due to uh, soil or class fragmentation. We also see the cliff retreat here as in different nodes that didn't have any material on them because they were cliff now retreating and now deliver, they delivered 
large material is delivered to these nodes. We can also look on the distribution in each node of grain sizes at, at the first, like between store one to 300, there is a prop change because of this, let's say rockfall and the grain size is much closer and then it's go fine again. And we end up with a relatively nice distribution of grain size. Next, we want to examine the rule of rainfall intensity. Here we, we act in kind, kind of a naive way. We use our base scenario case of a central negative case, and we change it by a factor. And so here are two cases where the, the, the factor, we uh, reduce the storm intensity by half, and this is the, where we increase it by half. And you can see that this kind of reach a steady state where the cliff sediment are not really getting buried the cliff, while in this case, uh, obviously maybe sediment are just uh, deposited and the cliff is getting thinner, no incision. In this case, relative to this case, where we get, uh, we start to get incision of the penalty. Taking these two factor together, so we have on one side the cliff, uh, the cliff sediment side. This is the sediment size of cliff delivered from, delivered from the cliff to the slope. And the other case is the rainfall intensity factor. We can now look on different combination of these two. Each point here is a combination um, of these two parameters. And we, the contour map is the end of simulation cliff height. And uh, this is an, I think it's a nice way to, to see that um, under high rainfall intensities, rainfall, the end of simulation um, cliff height is uh, relatively thick, um, while uh, if the grain size is supplied from the cliff are larger or the rainfall intensities are lower, the cliff is, the end of simulation uh, free phase cliff is, is relatively thin. And we have many of combinations, this is a, uh, in some of example, we have many of them of different combination of the cliff grain size to the specific rainfall intensity factor. Interesting to see that um, in this example, there is no cases where the lithological um, contact is exposed because it, the lithological, lithological contact is here. But in the reality, we do have such cases like in Mesoverda, right? We have a case where there is a cap rock and we obviously see that the cliff is retreating along maybe along this uh, little logo about contact. And a possible explanation for that could be uh, the initial cliff height. So here are two, here is a comparison of two simulations, one with initial cliff height of 50 meter and one with initial cliff height of 15 meter. And everything else, everything else except of the initial cliff height is, is similar. But as you can see the, in the right example, the cliff is retreating along the little local contact because the uh, overland flow is able to evacuate all the material supply from the cliff. In the other case, we have much, the flux from the cliff is much larger because the cliff is it itself is much larger. And then the cliff is actually started maybe to um, uh, bury a bit. If you are looking, if we are looking on the same diagram as before, but now I just normalize the end of simulation height by the initial height. That means that 100%, that means that the end of simulation would be exactly as the height of the cliff is exactly as was in the start of the uh, uh, simulation. And we have these two maps for two cases, one with 50 meter initial height and one with 15 meter initial height. So um, this area is the much interesting area. We can see that uh, the more red colors here or the darker red colors here relative to this side, that's mean that the end of simulation cliff height is, um, is very similar to the initial cliff height. And this a result of the undermining pattern of retreat uh, relative to this case when the uh, cliff uh, reaches kind of a quasi steady state uh, in time. Going even deeper on the pattern of cliff retreat, we can look on diagram of the x-axis is time or, or number of storms. And on the y-axis, there is the cliff height. And uh, we can see how in this specific simulation, it's a specific combination of rainfall intensities and uh, sediment size supply from the cliff. And the cliff is uh, um, reach a quasi steady state relatively fast. There is the opposite case 
where uh, the cliff is very, very fast get buried, and, and then we, I, I end up the simulations. And we have many other cases, right? and, and more complex cases, and we can divide them, uh, or, to, and, or we can recognize um, three main patterns uh, of retreat. The pink pattern is the pattern of, the, of uh, reaching re relatively fast the quasi steady state. The cliff is, uh, the, the transport power is much more uh, efficient re relatively to the flux of, from the cliff and therefore the uh, cliff reaches a, a, a quasi steady state quite fast. The blue pattern is the one that the cliff is getting buried really fast, while the um, gray pattern is the one that the cliff is started to get buried. But then at some point, because the slope is increasing, the runoff is also increasing, and therefore it's, it's uh, emerge or it's um, turned into this quasi steady state uh, stage. We can put numbers on this and to, to recognize in under which cases a, a cliff is getting buried or under which cases he's staying, let's say, alive. So mainly we can see that for cliff getting buried under the scenarios that we simulate here, that is similar to the Negev, a central Negev case, a rainfall intensity that are equal or smaller than what we have today. But if the cliff will supply a 50 meter, a 50 centimeter a grain sizes, he will ultimately get uh, buried. We can look on a similar diagram, but now for a case of, of a thin initial cliff. Before it was for 50 meters, and now it's for 15 meters. Here we see only two patterns. One pattern that the cliff ends up with a similar height as he started with, and this is the undermining pattern. The other case is uh, uh, when the cliff is getting uh, buried re uh, relatively fast. Also here we can put numbers and um, we can see that if the, the, the cliff initial height was uh, relatively uh, thin in a scale of few, a few meters, rainfall intensity smaller than today will uh, ultimately uh, get him to be buried. The last um, thing that I want to show you, and this is um, more a pr very pre preliminary result is uh, to see what will be the impact of changes in this extreme intensity in time. So this is also quite naive, but we take the 1000 uh, stones that we simulate and we split them to a half. Half of them 50,000 years period are uh, with the lower intensities. And then we have uh, other section with higher intensities. Um, so we can look on them on, uh, on the diagram uh, the video that uh, I guess you are you familiar with already, and you can see that around 500 stones sediment are getting transported much more fastly, and ultimately um, the sediment uh, reaches a stage of sediment star. So uh, a possible conclusion from that that changes in the rainstorm intensities could alter the cliff from two different geomorphic modes from sediment accumulation to sediment uh, star. Okay, I reach you to the conclusions. So um, first we developed here a cliff model, a cliff slope model that can account for observed characteristic and diversity of uh, arid cliffs and subcliff slope deserts. The model capture a geographic uh, analytical solution for bedrock below a uh, retreat cliff. The cliffs, we found that the cliff slope forms are highly dependent on cliff, the, uh, cliff debris sediment size and the storm intensities. Um, and we saw a high um, dependency of the cap rock of the cliff retreat pattern to the cap rock uh, thickness. We also um, have some hint that increase in rainfall intensities may alternate uh, the geomorphic modes of, uh, of the cliff from accumulation to sediment star phase. Under future work, we have much to do. Uh, first, we want to get into deeper into the rainfall forcing. We want to change the rainfall patterns to the, the frequency and duration and so on. Um, we also want to incorporate rainfall from different return levels, not only the 100 year storms. And um, we want to explore more field site and end cases. 
And the next major um, step will be to uh, uh, make simulation in 2D. Um, now we do it in effectively in kind of 1D and then explore reeling and galling pattern below the cliffs. And that's it. I will say thanks again um, to Mark and also people that help with field measurements. And uh, of, of course, all the uh, colleagues that uh, helped me with the work. And I will uh, invite you to join our session in the upcoming EGU. Uh, you can scan this barcode or, or just uh, submit uh, according to the title. And that's it. Well, we can uh, open it up for questions now. You can either um, raise your hand um, and ask your questions directly to you all, or I will be monitoring the chat for any um, questions that appear there. To kick us off, I can I can ask a question, which is, um, uh, what is your, what are your thoughts? And you touched a little bit of this on your next steps in, in the future. Um, but what are your thoughts in terms of taking the design storm approach towards simulating um, uh, sediment transport? So, in using one recurrence time. And how do you think you're going to be able to test, you know, thinking about a whole probability distribution of, of events um, by taking such a, an approach? Yeah, um, yeah, that's true. So now we are actually simulating, um, we, yeah, we are actually simulating all the time we repeat on the same storm. This is the 100 year storm that is based on, what is it? This is based on, Rainfall statistics from the Negev. Um, and uh, yeah, it's quite a naive approach and we just repeat this storm assuming no, no change in the intensities. Um, we uh, accept, I think that first it's, uh, it's reasonable in some way because we know that um, sediment transport in deserts uh, happen, um, they're not happen oftenly, at least. So we need to, to examine what exactly is the threshold, like what is right, what is the, the, the storm return level threshold for, for this transport. Um, and we don't know if it's, it's exactly, if it's the 100 years or not. We do have some simulation results from a paper in 2020 in Tsuk Tamu. it's a different site that I mentioned. There we know that the frequency for mobilization is around 100 years. So let's say if it was a, a Tamur case, I guess the, uh, the effect of including Lower return level will not have much because we know that sediment, like we calculate or we have some um, conclusion that uh, sediment transport occurs during rare, this rare storm, at least 100 year storm. But it's probably different all over the world, right? So um, yeah, it could be, it could alternate the, the, the geomorphic modes uh, for sure. Um, um, and we, this is one of the next uh, tasks to include um, storms from different return levels and to, to examine actually if they are, have impact that is important um, to have in the long term simulation or not. Thanks. Uh, Benjamin, you want to ask your question? No, we can't hear you, Benjamin. No, you are muted. You're still on mute, Benjamin. I guess he's typing. I he cannot answer me. Oh. Do, you, do you hear me now? You yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, we can hear you. Okay, yeah. fine. Yeah, I couldn't unmute. I think it was a setting or something. Um, so so thanks uh, for changing that. Um, so hi, Yuval. Good to see you, man. Um, Hello. Very nice talk. Um, and very very rich in in experiments and data. Uh, super nice. Um, I was just wondering, yes. and you 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 talked a bit about that, but um, so 
if you have like higher precipitation amounts, you see more evacuation of your sediment and your cliff gets taller. Um, but I was wondering how, like, can you weigh the difference between the total precipitation versus an increase in storm intensities? So I'm, I'm kind of wondering how you set your threshold um, to, to consider the impact of like big storms versus a lot of like medium size smaller events um yeah so actually we don't have it here now like this um let's say this kind of scenarios are assuming that the most effective or the most geomorphic effective events are the 100 extremes the 100 year storms this is um, our assumption and this is something that uh, came out from uh, other works in the Negev and, and also from other people over the world that extreme storm are, let's say, more, let's say, important in terms of geomorphic differences. Um, the, I think if I um, connect even better to what you are saying, the, we, have, we need to improve the fact that maybe the, the total rainfall may not only affect the runoff generation, but it could alternate also the weathering pattern. Or let's mm -hmm. say how the how specifically the cliff is um, uh, retreating. And for now we we don't have like a, a mechanistically way to do it. We um, like the weathering pattern and the weathering um, class side and so on, they are parameters. So my solution to, to your um, question would be First, to include, uh, maybe to as as I said to Matt, maybe to include a uh, rainstorm with uh, lower intensities in the simulation as well, and also maybe to find some connection between the uh, total rainfall and maybe the weathering patterns, and then uh, maybe uh, we will have some findings regarding this change. But here we're assuming that the most effective changes will occur under extreme storms, and th this is why we we are simulating only them. Very clear. Thank you. Albert? Are you follow? Thank you for your awesome talk. Um, I have two questions. Um, since you're simulating over long, long time scales, it could happen, for example, that um, whole climate regime changes, right? So th there could be a desert environment that, that changes into a more temporal and therefore, you know, uh, plant species might take. Uh, mm -hmm. A more important role. Have you thought about um, somehow hooking up? Maybe I, I'm not sure if this is possible with other land lab components, so that they start to, um, you know, interact basically with your component uh, when when such happens. That so that's the first question. And the second question is uh, maybe a little bit related about chemical erosion. I. I can imagine that you know if you change your uh, rain intensity, um, there could also be a change in chemical weathering, mm -hmm. and you know could could that impact any of your 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 outcomes you're generating right now? So. Yeah, I, so I think the the both of the question are related, and also I think it's related mm -hmm. to Benjamin's question, if I understand right. So. Um, yeah, we don't have now the connection between the, let's say the mean conditions, the mean climate conditions and, um, um, and the process that happened on the slope. Actually, I should say that we do have it, but we don't have it in a physical way. Like these are our parameters, let's say the weathering patterns, the retreat rate, they are all parameters in the model. Actually, the only parameter that are not physically based. Overland flow, the full hydrology is, a, is a physically based. But there are kind of external forcing, like what is the patterns of uh, retreating and what are the patterns of rain sizes, which are all depends, as you said, on, on the general climate or the, the main conditions. So we can examine, actually we can, um, I guess, yeah, it will be easy to simulate, to make an experiments of different climate, let's say more humid climate when the weather is maybe in greater and the cluster, I don't know, maybe smaller or larger, we can think about it. But this is the way that now we can include such uh, chances. Like we don't have a really physical way now to do it. Okay, thank you.
Any other questions? Well, let's uh, thank you all for just an awesome talk and sharing this with us today. Yeah, thank you everyone. It was nice to be here.